leader in the commercial. Pat has been a leader in commercialization of uh, clean and renewable energy for quite a while. And uh, we just got started on the uh, recording. And I also want to say thank you, MCAT, for, for giving us this presentation. We look forward to hearing it. Uh, Pat, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, you know, the Metro Climate Action Team is a um, is a group of, of dedicated um, climate activists. And you know, we work for primarily at the state legislative session, sec uh, sector, um, looking for legislation statewide. You know, we, we organize constituent groups and talk to our legislators oh, regularly. You know, we work to elect climate champions. Um, you know, we um, work with other coalitions, you know, in, in coalitions of other climate and environmental groups to counter the fossil fuel industry. And you know, we're organized as a 12 person steering committee and we have a sizable mailing list and some social media outlets as well. And we right now we're organized in, in certain focus areas, uh, forestry, transportation, clean buildings and methane. And, and we follow areas like divestment. So you're gonna hear from several members of our steering committee uh, who are following these particular areas. Uh, since there's so much to follow, there's gonna be so many bills and so much activity in this upcoming session that you know, we're, we really need to and, and have been dividing the workload so that we can uh, do as much as possible. Um, and I'm gonna go back to the kind of the agenda here. So um, I'm giving the introduction here. Um, Dan's going to give you an overview of our, our process, you know, how we decide what bills we're going to try to follow. And I'm going to focus on the clean building sector. Rich Peppers will talk about transportation. Catherine Thomason uh, about our forestry activities. And, and Dan will wrap it up again with uh, our divestment and some other general activities. So um, moving forward here, Dan, would you like to uh, give a short introduction of yourself and and yeah, uh, Dan Fry. I um, I'm a theoretical atomic physicist um, by training. Uh, that that work doesn't come up much in climate work. Uh, but if if we ever need to solve Schrodinger's equation to reduce greenhouse gases, I am I'm just I'm ready for that. <laughs> uh, I spent most of my uh, career leading engineering software engineering teams in the IT space, and I when I retired, I started. Uh, uh, working on climate activism. So for us, um, our legislative uh, process has become a, a, a year-round process. Um, it, it, when we first started, uh, re, when Renew had a large staff, uh, we were all uh, kind of spoon-fed, you know, uh, what bills to pay attention to, what positions to take. That has gone, that has gone away frankly, with the success of Renew. And so um, we uh, uh, now principally drive our, our, our support based on what we know and what we see. So uh, as an example of what we're going through right now, uh, it's a long session coming up. So uh, in April and May, we had internal discussions about uh, what we wanted to see, blue sky, what we wanted, you know, wanted to have happen uh, in the next session. Uh, we keep track of our losses, and we had some in the short session last time that showed up th this year as well. And then we, we have brief uh, uh, but meaningful conversations with 20 or 30 other activist groups where we uh, and there are some of those people we've talked to on a, uh, for other groups on this call. I noticed, and we we exchange ideas. Um, we uh, some somewhere time around May we cre create an initial outlook. Uh, we test it with some key legislators that we know well enough uh, that we're not worried about making a mistake, uh, and we get a refinement. And then we we ask our legislative leads to set up meetings with legislators uh, during the first part of the summer to take them through the outlook. Um, and these, these discussions with legislators are, are, are two-way discussions. It's, it's often true that we know we're following legislation uh, uh, that they don't know about because no legislator uh, that I have ever met uh, is able to keep track of everything that's going on. 
uh, we're barely able to keep track of uh, uh, just climate related bills. And but we also we also learn from those legislators uh, uh, things that are going on and sometimes insights around our our bills. Then after that, uh, we we spend time you know listening to what's going on, talking uh, to uh, continue to talk to other groups. Legislators know more, uh, and then we have a fall uh, session with the legislators uh, once again to uh, keep them apprised of what's going on. <laughs> Often by this time, some uh, some uh, uh, bills have legislative concepts in in progress. Uh, sometimes, uh, in, in other cases, like with clean buildings, this time there are task forces going on all year long that we pay attention to and and, and use to refine our outlook. Then. Um, uh, in in December or January, uh, we refine our uh, outlook for the final time, and we adjust it to conform to the final Oregon Conservation Network priorities. Uh, we consider ourselves a, a group in support of those priorities. Those are the those are uh, that that group. If you're not familiar with it. Uh, has uh, uh, organizations like OLCV and, and uh, uh, Oregon Environmental Council, Climate Solutions, Sierra Club, and a number of others. And so they agree among themselves, those large groups, what the top two, three, four, five prior legislative priorities are for the uh, environmental and um, uh, climate issues. Uh, and so we always make sure that we align with that uh, exactly. We often, we generally, in fact, always have more bills to follow than the, those simple priorities, but we do make sure that there are our top bill. Um, and uh, then during the long session, we'll meet with legislators as needed. Um, and the short session is, it's uh, uh, obviously it starts later uh, and uh, has only um, a couple of meetings with legislators. Okay. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, you know, I think this is gonna be an interesting session coming up, you know, just some things to keep in mind if you're following any legislation is that there's gonna be restrictions with regards to access to the building because of construction that's taking place. But fortunately, you know, the hearings are still gonna be available on OLIS. And so participation through OLIS is still pretty uh, convenient uh, compared to having to go down there to Salem. Um, so um, there are a lot of new members and, 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 you know, we still have a fairly strong progressive majority in, in the legislature. So we're really hopeful of passing some important bills. Um, and I didn't really introduce myself. I am uh, Patty LaQuill. I'm a climate policy, energy systems modeler and climate policy analyst um, that I've been working in this field for 40 years or so. Um, so I am leading with, uh, co-leading with Linda Clark, Craig, our clean buildings, um, and methane team. And we've been mostly following the uh, re the Resilient and Efficient Buildings Task Force. This is a joint task force of the legislature. And we are optimistic, you know, they went through a long process of, of trying to identify what policies were needed to help the state meet its overall climate goals. And we're really focusing on building sector and we're really expecting some important legislation here in, in the area of of improvements to the state building code, creating some a building performance standard for existing commercial buildings that will help improve efficiency over time, um, incentives to advanced heat pump, especially in concert with the incentives coming through from the Inflation Reduction Act, um, and then improvements to efficiency and indoor air quality in state-funded buildings and uh, with a focus on schools. So. Um, we're still waiting for the um, the LCS or the 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 draft bill should be available any time now. We're still scrambling to to identify those and uh, figure out how to you know what they're actually saying and and how we may want to go about supporting those. Um, next, I'm going to turn it over to. I, I guess we have it. The order is not the same as I gave you in the agenda, so you'll have to apologize here, um, Catherine. This is um, our forestry sector, natural climate solutions. 
Great, thank you very much. Um, so um, I'm going to focus on this legislative session and um, uh, want to highlight um, the most important climate bill in this arena, and that is Senate Bill 530, introduced by Senator Dembro. And basically, uh, it's called the Natural Climate Solutions Bill. Um, so the, it defines what is and what are natural climate solutions. Um, they are the ability to protect and enhance um, carbon uptake and storage in our natural and working lands, and in addition, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions such as methane from cows or fertilizer, nitrogen oxides, and fuel use, um, at the same time maintaining or increasing climate resilience, water quality and quantity, human well-being, and biodiversity. So that's a definition in the bill, and I think it's pretty all-encompassing. If you go to the next slide, um, I think it's um, really important for us to understand that we have an incredible resource here in Oregon. Our west side forests store even more carbon per acre than the tropical rainforests. So um, a study was, no, please stay on that slide. Um, a study was done um, by our um, chair of our Global Warming Commission um, that showed the various activities we could have, the climate solutions that can reduce Oregon's emissions by 30%. So it's a huge potential solution that we need to take advantage of. It's a big deal. Um, the best big deal is keeping our in forests, our ecosystems, our rangelands, and even our agricultural lands protected and preserved because they hold and continue to store carbon. Go ahead and, and go to the next slide. I like this slide because it's important for us to understand, well, what does this really mean? You know, plants, unlike us, take up carbon dioxide and turn it into sugars that turn it into biomass. And therefore you have these huge tree trunks and plant mass um, that holds carbon. So that's the uptake out of the atmosphere and the storage. If you look at the bottom of the slide in our forests, uh, and really around the world, 42 to 50% of forest carbon is in the soil. So in reality, when a, when a forest burns, only five to 10% of that carbon in an intact forest is released. Um, one of the bad things about um, clear cuts is that you denude um, the, the hillside. So you're at risk of erosion of that soil, um, you're diminishing the amount of material and new plantation growth only starts a net positive storage after 10 to 15 years. Um, so it's important for us to realize that also one of the best carbon climate solutions is if you grow a tree to 40 year, 80 years in our forests, you get more than double the timber than cutting it at two 40 year intervals with a lot more carbon storage and protection in the soil. So that's a really important point. Go ahead and do the next slide. Um, another important um, car natural carbon solution, natural climate solution is reforestation. So let's put forests and trees back where they belong. And that's specifically also around rivers and streams. It has a lot of uh, amazingly important co-benefits. It reduces soil loss. It re, um, takes up nutrients so that nitrogen doesn't run off of the fields. It provides pollination um, and um, stores a lot of carbon, as you can see from all those black roots down there in the soil. Go ahead with the next slide. Um, and so where's the greenhouse gases, both uptake and emissions in agriculture? Um, go ahead and click. Um, one of the top mechanisms or techniques is to plant cover crops in fallow fields and between rows. Um, basically, it puts more carbon in the soil in the roots and provides natural water holding ability and fertilization. It reduces soil erosion um, 
And because of the increase in carbon in the soil, there are reduced fertilizer needs. And, and we all know that nitrogen oxides are uh, a greenhouse gas. Um, and of course, um, cows and um, other um, animal agriculture produces a lot of methane and other greenhouse gas. Go ahead and turn the slide. Um, so what does this bill do? This bill does uh, four major things. Um, it sets sequestration, meaning both carbon uptake and storage as a policy of the state. That was written up in the executive order on climate and we wanna codify it. Um, it. We require a decision on what is the comprehensive carbon inventory so we know how to measure how we're improving. Um, it funds a study that will establish what kind of metrics are we going to use? Amount of acres and cover crops um, and, and the age rotations for trees. We need to de develop a metric basis that we can use and also a community-based impact metric about these policies. So basically it sets up a fund that the agencies, uh, the natural resource agencies will provide technical assistance and incentives to landowners and managers um, and we'll also leverage some significant funding from the uh, Inflation Reduction Act um, and private investments to advance these projects. Go ahead and next slide. The benefits from these activities are increasing rural jobs, which we desperately need. Reforestation requires people. Uh, replanting, um, selective logging takes four people compared to one when you're logging in a clear-cut fashion. It reduces the climate impacts because we have cooler, more re fire-resistant forests. It improves our water quality and quantity uh, and obviously continues to create wildlife habitat. Next slide. Um, this is a picture of no-till agriculture. This huge uh, machine is planting amid a crop, a cover crop that was just mowed leaving again all the roots in place. Um, and he, on the agriculture side, it improves uh, and reduces water needs, fertilizer needs, the amount of times you have to use a tractor for tillage uh, on the soil um, and improves uh, pollinator habitat. So there's lots and lots of benefits to these activities. Next slide. So I think it's really important um, for all of us to lobby and let our legislators know that this bill is really an important bill to establish here in Oregon. Um, feel free to join our email list. Um, and um, we, the, there will be a forum to go more in depth on what this bill entails um, on January 25th for people who are interested. That's it. Thank you, Catherine. And um, what, I, what I failed to say is that, um, we should, I think we decided it might make sense to stop after each sector and, and see if there are specific questions, for example. So I know I went over the clean buildings area already, um, but maybe we should take a minute to see if there are any burning questions for either clean buildings or forestry and or natural working lands and where else we can move on. Anything that you see in the chat, Mike? Nope. Let me look. Nothing. No. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, I, then, I, then. I have I have a question oh. on on buildings. Is anything being done about allowing more fuel switching? Things like the Energy Trust is not allowed yes. to. Yes. Yes. That 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 was embedded in one of those one of those items that I mentioned. Um, Great. So yes. So this. Um, yeah. Here is the number three. Is oh, Sorry, it keeps flipping on me here. So improve efficiency of, oh, I have to move this to read. Um, incentives uh, to strengthen the estate's energy efficiency programs include removing the restrictions from, from, oh, from the Energy Trust of Oregon. Yes, I believe okay. that's, that's in there. But that's one of those details. We have to look at the bills to really know how well it's being dealt yeah. with. And we don't know that answer yet. So yeah, that's a question, Kathy. And Alan, I see a hand. Okay, thanks so much. This one's for Catherine. Um, I've been looking at the Senate Bill 530, Catherine, and I'm, I'm pretty happy with the bill itself, but I'm not very happy with some of the word usage and the um, 
definitions, particularly the definition of uh, climate resilience, which in the bill itself refers to human systems, but uh, which I'm sorry, in the definitions refers to human systems, but then the language of the bill constantly refers to climate resilience in relation to natural systems, which is entirely reasonable. And so uh, my question is, and maybe you cannot answer this, why did the, did the authors not use a definition of climate resilience, which encompasses natural systems? And funnily enough, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its policy uh, summary for policymakers has a definition which is perfect for that. My other concern is, uh, and, and you were very careful, I noticed, talk about, talking about carbon uptake and storage, but the bill itself frequently talks about sequestration or sequester and store, and that's totally redundant. And I'm, I'm totally fed up with people not understanding and writing bills that use the term sequest, phrase sequester and store when the term sequester means capture and store. Um, and I know there are folks out there who misuse the term sequester to mean just capture, but in a bill, let's be accurate. And if it's necessary to have a definition in a bill, let's put the definition. Sequester means to capture and store. So um, minor points, I know, but a couple of things that kind of irritate me. Yeah, I can't speak to the resilience. We were, um, I think some of the other issues that were discussed much more um, had to do with balancing the needs um, and looking at, you know, what, how to set up this program. So the bill didn't pass last session, and this bill is more involved than the previous bill. Um, they have already set up a commission, and just like all the rest of these things, um, the definite, the, the, the rulemaking and the program development is really an important component. So I'm very delighted to see that the commission that has been set up under the executive order um, does include a significant number of people who do understand the definition of climate resilience and, and the importance of natural systems um, as the best value. I mean, we're really lucky in Oregon that we have a strong land use system that helps do that protection for us. Um, but there's been some concern about, you know, agriculture land has the lowest amount of embodied carbon um, and forests have the greatest. So we want to keep forests, forests and rangelands, rangelands um, as well. So developing the program in each natural resource group is going to be where we're all going to be bird dogging. Thanks, Pat. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Catherine. Catherine, I was uh, happy to hear that you mentioned clear cutting, and but I would guess that, boy, getting anything uh, related to that, any uh, reduction is going to be a challenge. Have you had any more input on that? So um, this bill was designed to just help set the programs up and designed to have a lot of carrots and not any sticks. Um, and so, again, looking further down the road, that's that's kind of important. The incentives grouping is most likely to occur on private small woodland owner land. Um, so we need to keep pushing on the federal level for better federal management of our forests, of which 60% of our forest lands here in Oregon are federal. And then of the part that's private, which is about 30%, um, a third of that is the smaller woodland owners. So they are more likely to be incentivized to have, to leave their trees grow longer and to get carbon uh, payments or easement payments that will keep them that way. Um, and I think that in the agriculture sector is really, and, and the things that we can actually pay for like reforestation along streams, pr protection and improvement in our tidal wetlands, which can really take up a lot of carbon um, so I think initially those will be the things that get focused on. And then as we move forward, sort of see what, what, where else we can go with this. Thank you. Great. I have a, yes. A question. I don't know if you can hear me there, but, um, yes. I, um, I'm wondering, uh, what sort of buy-in do we have from the, um, or the Oregon State uh, Department of Forestry there, they got the Forest Product Research Lab and so forth. And I'm wondering what uh, 
do they um, are they in favor of doing away with clear cutting? What's their position on that? You know, is there so a the Oregon Department of Forestry um, has had some significant um, improvement in the uh, awareness and desire to improve management for climate change. Um, so they just actually voted uh, to increase looking at carbon um, and climate change in their own management of our state lands. Um, they have some technical folks who are working hard on this and have been um, in favor of this bill, uh, who, who are actually members and, and part of the division that's gonna be managing this program. Um, we also, of course, the, uh, the biggest push on this bill will be getting it through the budget and getting these positions and more positions funded in each of these areas, Department of Agriculture, Watershed Enhancement Board, um, and Wildlife um, Management would be the four areas, including forestry, that would be supported by this bill in terms of increasing programs. Yeah. Any any other questions here? And then we can also we can move on to transportation. Um, Rich uh, is going. Rich Peppers is going to give our transportation talk. And Rich, why don't you give a short introduction of yourself as well? Get to your slides. Oops. Here we go. I had to unmute myself. Yes, happy to do it. Uh, Rich Peppers. I'm on the transportation committee. I should um, acknowledge that Jane Stackhouse uh, is a co-leader uh, and on our steering committee as well, a co-leader of the transportation committee. And Ed Averill, who is somewhere here in the audience, is also active on our transportation committee and uh, may want to jump in at some point too with answering questions or um, participation. But um, my background is a uh, 35, 40 year career in the labor movement. And I retired about seven years ago um, and unretired for about a year and have just recently re-retired. And um, now back in the climate movement with everybody else here. So, um, the work on our transportation issue, the transportation sector, first of all, is generally acknowledged to be either the highest or second highest emitting sector of our economy and uh, a greenhouse gas emitting sector, depending on who you ask. But um, in Oregon, it's about 40%, uh, generally acknowledged to be about 40%, and that's pretty high, big plurality probably. And um, it's a complex area that requires the committee, the transportation committee, to work for solutions and toward solutions in a lot of different state agencies that have policy jurisdiction over different things, um, like whether it's roads, which is ODOT department, uh, ODOT or, um, or fuels and um, issues and air quality, like uh, what Department of Environmental Quality would be responsible for, or uh, land use questions like where siting and roads uh, and other kinds of issues can be located and how communities will be set up and how you can, through careful land use, um, influence vehicle miles traveled um, all of those are different agencies that we try to stay abreast with and uh, in touch with in order to try and promote solutions that are policy or, um, or budget solutions for the problems that come from greenhouse gas in the transportation sector. So what are the areas that our transportation committee is currently and together with MCAT overall focused on, even though it's not per se a statewide uh, policy issue, um, but it's definitely a statewide budget issue and a statewide impact issue. The interstate bridge replacement is uh, one of our 
big concerns and we're trying to work in coalition with other groups that are concerned about it. Um, the No More Freeways Coalition um, is where we currently participate in coalition work, but there's a, a lot of other groups that are um, also focused in this discussion and uh, legislative interest in this is high and split. Um, the issues involved in this particular question are everybody agrees that due to seismic concerns um, and the big one being on the horizon, we need a new bridge that's more uh, prepared for that kind of a event. But what the makeup of that bridge will be and uh, what the features will be and whether it will have transit, public transit and encourage active transportation and how high it will be and many other questions are still up in the air, including the question of how much money it will cost or it will be allocated for it, which might influence some of the planning decisions. Right now, the plan, the current plan is for uh, approximately a billion dollars to be allocated by the state of Oregon, but uh, the overall project as designed by ODOT and um, other planners would cost somewhere in the seven to eight billion dollars range with a lot of federal money making up the difference. Um, in along the lines of encouraging active transportation and reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The, there's a bill that we don't have the bill number for yet, but the legislative concept bill uh, number is 1994 that would uh, allow for subsidizing e-bikes. And e-bikes, as you've probably heard and seen, have gained in popularity and are really um, booming uh, here in Oregon, at least in the Northwest. But um, we want to encourage even lower income people and others that might not see e-bikes as feasible for them to be able to afford and encourage even a, an even bigger explosion of the use of e-bikes um, for transportation. Um, studies show that e-bikes, when used, do replace other vehicle travel and um, not necessarily in a one-for-one -one relationship, but definitely um, contribute to reducing vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's a proposal to require high, high power users. Um, oh, sorry, the, that's a different bill I'm thinking of. Um, this one, the Better Fuels Oregon proposal is to uh, set a carbon intensity value of 60 for all on-road transportation diesel fuels sold in the state and um, require that a phase transition take place ending in 2030 so that, and this applies to on-road vehicles only. Um, and a lot of bio, a lot of diesel use is, of course, off-road. Um, and biomass for renewable diesel is an ongoing discussion. This would be a study bill in order to advance the discussion and get the uptake for replacing regular diesel with renewable diesel, which is a drop-in fuel for diesel and can be done relatively easily and reduce carbon intensity. Uh, there are other transportation issues uh, out there, um, but uh, these are the ones that we're currently on our tracking and promoting. And that's uh, probably a point where we should see if there are questions or comments from anybody yeah. in the group. Sure. I see Alan. a hand, hand from Alan. Alan. Yeah, I, uh, I appreciate the list that you have here. I want to ask about one that's not here, and I know it's a contentious issue, but I, for, for a long time, I've been very concerned about the, um, the tendency, I think it's a real uh, reality for Oregon to, to consider 
uh, biofuels as zero carbon fuels, which is totally not true. Um, unfortunately, the consequence of uh, that um, designation is that whenever somebody uses biofuels, they get a free pass. Uh, can you imagine any way of correcting the mistake in the Oregon system that allows biofuels to be de designated as something that ab absolutely not? Well, the, uh, uh, well I, go ahead, Rich, I'm sorry. I was going to say we've had multiple conversations in the Transportation Committee on this very subject and um, don't have a magic solution. I would say, <laughs> as you pointed out, it's a contentious issue. Um, in general, we think that the discussion and the solution has to occur within the context of the clean fuels program of the state. And, um, and so it's a question of um, lobbying the agency to modify and California as a consequence, uh, because that's where uh, Oregon got its clean fuels program um, basics from, but it's, a, it's an involved, complicated program. And the science on it is not, uh, mm -hmm. is disputed. I mean, there, there's science uh, on both sides of the issue and we try well, to but, align but ourselves. Rich, so Rich, I'd, uh, but I'm sorry. Yeah, let me, let me try to differentiate because there's really two issues here. And I think the, the clean fuels program uses a carbon intensity factor. So there is no zero emission, uh, uh, you know, question for, for, for biomass there. It's, it really has to do with, with the um, greenhouse gas accounting system, which we've inherited from the IPCC internationally that gives biomass a, a free pass as being carbon neutral. And, and that was a simplification that we've lived with for many years. And I don't know why they don't quite fix it, honestly. Um, but I, I think it's important to differentiate where we do have carbon intensity factors and, and where we do not which is a problem, and that impacts the the uh, climate protection plan because biomass gets a free pass there as well, but not in the clean fuels program. Okay, and I will I will add that um, back to to Alan's direct question. Uh, uh, Pat and I and a couple others lobbied hard to for the uh, for the Better Fuels Oregon uh, bill to include that redefinition. Uh, and to, uh, we uh, and we haven't seen the bill yet. I, I, uh, uh, I, I there's some possibility that it, it will be there. Uh, the 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 writer of that bill was re reluctant, but he did listen to us, and we we leaned on him pretty hard. So yeah, it's a known problem, and we don't have a fix yet. And I, right. you know, we're happy to keep working on it. But uh, same time, we want to make progress on the legislation as it is too. Other questions or yeah. comments? And thanks, Pat and Dan, for jumping in. No problem. No problem. I think Dan, you're up next here with um, yeah. our exiting fossil fuel investments. So the background here is that the Oregon State Treasury has manages about $140 billion uh, in assets, uh, mostly split between public and private equity. About $97 billion of that are uh, public employee pensions. So the, 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 the retirement uh, of, of hundreds of thousands of Oregonians is, is dependent on on uh, uh, those investments doing well over time. The, the, Oregon, the, the decisions for the treasury are made by the, the tre treasurer and the members of the Oregon Investment Council, and they continue to invest heavily in fossil fuel investments. Even, even they, they recognize that fossil fuel investments are, are decreasing uh, uh, and uh, uh, in, they are, doing worse in the market than non-fossil fuel investments. They understand the risk of stranded assets, and yet they continue to um, invest. 
So in, so in uh, 2021, uh, a coalition was started, a divest Oregon coalition, to lobby for changes in investment policies uh, at the uh, Treasury. It became obvious quickly that the Treasurer and the OIC were going to make no such change. And so the strategy uh, shifted during the 2022 session to legislation, to uh, 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 pass a bill that would, would force uh, divestment over time. Uh, that bill uh, came close to passing, but it ran out of time. Uh, it's come back uh, for 2023 in a stronger form. It's now called the uh, Treasury Investment and Climate Protection Act. There is uh, um, uh, six basic points, an immediate moratorium on new carbon intensive, immediate exit from the worst uh, uh, carbon investments in six months, exit from public investments uh, by the largest fossil fuel companies. And these things have definition what largest and, and most carbon intensive, et cetera, but I, I didn't include that here. Within two years, exist from uh, uh, exit from the private investments by 2035. Those are difficult to exit quickly. They need to essentially time out um, there, because there's not there's not a, a, a liquid. Uh, they, they're illiquid investments and difficult to. Uh, if you get rid of them before they run out, uh, it's it, uh, you're going to take a, a loss. Um, they're asking for a, a climate resilience plan uh, within a, within a environmental justice framework and they and they want the treasury to say what they're doing what investments they have what investments they're making and they want to make that uh, uh, public so I have an ask there are 98 groups including MCAT who are sponsors of the divest Oregon coalition climate environmental senior support organizations public unions uh, but not ESF I would ask the ESF to consider joining uh, as a as a sponsor. We will indeed consider. Thank you. Next chart. Last thing we're going to talk about. Uh, just there's a couple other things going on. Uh, uh, reduction in diesel uh, from stationary sources. Uh, city's right to electrify Northwest Natural is threatening uh, lawsuits. Uh, 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 every time a city, uh, you know, contemplates, you know, banning new fossil fuel uh, hookups. There are uh, HB 2021, which guaranteed 100% electrical uh, uh, production by renewables by 24 has some loopholes in it. And there's a bill called 100% uh, clean for big tech to close those loopholes for those large uh, data centers uh, increasingly found in the uh, in and around the gorge. And there is a, a lot of focus, including one of the top priorities of Governor Kotek is to figure out how to make it easier to build and site uh, renewable energy facilities. Okay, so uh, any questions uh, on either the last two topics or frankly, anything that we've talked about mm -hmm. here today? Yeah, I, I, have, I have a comment and a question. Hey, Kathy, okay. Okay, um, I'm actually on that renewable energy siting table. Oh, good. Uh, by the way, Kathy, hold on a sec. Uh, could we get the screen replaced? What would you like, Dan? Oh. I, I think we, we we should take the the um, the charts down. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Just the, then let me just finish up before you answer, Kathy, because okay. I get, I wanna make sure that people on the call know that if you uh -huh. want to get be informed, you want you know join our email list. Just send us an email at info.mcat.olcv@gmail.com. We'll you'll get uh, action alerts. You'll find out about campaign opportunities. You'll get updates on things that are happening. If you want to follow particular bills? There are teams that you can join. So please um, sign up so we can keep you informed. And so please go ahead, Dan. I'll take the slides down so we can see everybody. Okay. All right, Kathy. You wound up getting a call. Uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, this is Doug. I've got a question on the <clears throat> city's moves to not allow natural gas for construction. So if that's your position too, then what's your solution when you have 
a situation where you have a massive winter storm and power outages and people aren't allowed to have natural gas or any other fossil fuel backup there, are you proposing that they just pipes freeze and people freeze to death? I mean, you need to have some solutions too, as opposed to just turn around and say no fossil fuel. That, that's a very good point. And, and there are solutions. Those solutions will take time to implement and in some cases even develop, but we have time. This is not a change that's going to happen immediately over time. Nobody's going to have their gas furnace ripped out of their house. Um, this is, you know, what cities are doing in, in many ways is saying, for new construction, we don't want to use gas because of the climate risks. And also there are indoor health risks as well. Now, the question then becomes, you know, what happens with existing buildings? You know, so that's going to be a choice for people to make over time. Do they want to replace a gas furnace with an electric heat pump? And as we move over the next 20 to 30 years towards a more all electric system, we're going to develop technologies. We already have them. We simply need to implement them in ways that, that make sense that provide distributed storage, distributed generation, a greater interconnected grid, and a much more reliable grid so that we aren't going to have this problem of, of, of major catastrophes, you know, people losing power as frequently as we, as we do in many cases today, because we will have resilience hubs. We will, there are a lot of ideas that, that people are working on that are going to improve the resilience and the reliability of the electricity grid as it grows to ex expand and, and, and serve both not just the, you know, the transportation needs for electric vehicles, but also the heating needs as cooling needs as well for buildings. And I think those are all challenges that, that we have the technology and the know-how to deal with. And we have the time to make that transition. This is not something where anybody's gonna cut off, cut off overnight. Also, well, uh, most, most, um, most gas heating systems are dependent on electric electricity to provide heat. Yeah, but if you've got a gas furnace, you have the option of getting a 2000 watt generator and running your furnace. If you're totally electric and the grid goes down, you're basically out of luck. And it's nice to say, what are the solutions? But Milwaukee, as I understand it, passed a law saying new construction basically now or whenever that law goes into effect, can't use gas furnaces for heating. And so the issue is somebody builds a new facility, a new apartment complex, a new house, whatever. They have to put in electric heating. Five years down the road, we have a Dallas 2021 situation in February where it gets down to, well, like we did here in the 1980s. You know, it got down to six, eight degrees and stayed there for five days. And there were tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people without power. What's the solution? I mean, this isn't a, you know, you impose these rules now and, you know, the solution isn't here until 30, 40 years from now. It's not going to do those people any good if you don't have the solutions before you impose the limitations my, my solution is the same one that you, you suggested. I, I have a backup generator. Yeah. And battery systems are going to become more and more cost effective as well as backup systems. Right now, I have a, I have a you know, battery sitting in my garage that's, that's incorporated into my car. If I could plug it into my home, I could run my home for three days. But so you there are heat... solutions and there are near-term solutions that we're going to see more of. Um, and, and again, you know, there's nothing that's going to protect you from all events. Yeah, and, but... and in fact, having a gas furnace is not a solution in, a, in an outage unless, of course, you then have a generator. But then why not have a battery backup? It's... Because the battery backup capacity needs to be literally like hundreds of kilowatt hours. And that's yeah, way there, more and, that, and that is exactly what I have sitting in my car right now. And, and you could have one in your garage and um, you could store one. You could have a several megawatt hour battery for your community 
that could then be isolated during an outage like that and run on its own for several days. These are all solutions that we need to figure out over time. But they're not there now. I'm back. I'm back. Kathy, okay. go ahead. Okay, Kathy. Yeah. Um, okay, it turns out I'm also on the table working on resilience and microgrids. <laughs> okay. Um, but my question was, um, I, I guess probably for Dan, are you also looking into the uh, legislation for public bank? Um, we, we actually had that on our list um, earlier the, this year uh, in our, our, our first couple of outlooks. Uh, it's, it, uh, we, have, we, we haven't heard it uh, in months, and so we took it off our list. We, we would be delighted you know, uh, to, to support that. But do you know that somebody's bringing it forward? Um, uh, all I know is uh, my, the, 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 the coordinator of my climate emergency portfolio in the League of Women Voters is really enthusiastic about it. You know, okay. one well, of the things, I, one of the, I'm sorry, Dan, one of the requirements or, you know, we look for, Kathy, is that, you know, we're, many of these bills, we simply don't have the people to follow them. So if you want to volunteer to kind of follow that bill, then we would be happy to track it and, and help you organize. Yeah, well, we're, we're uh, the league is members of OCM, so. Okay. So I will, I will yeah, suggest well, we, to, to uh, Claudia that it might get interest if, if she brings it up. Okay. Yeah. She's, a, uh, she's one of like our I reps, don't see end. Yeah, like I said, we, we had it on our list of things we wanted to support. I mean, it seems like a, seems like a really good idea, not just for- I think it's a great for, idea. I think it's a great idea. And there are <laughs> examples, you know, progressive state like North Dakota can do it, right? right. I think they can do it, right? So. Yeah. All right, looks like we got about five minutes left. You know, and, and I think, you know, as, as, as Dan has said, this is a continuing process for us to update our knowledge of these particular bills as they, as they progress through the session. And so we will be periodically updating our outlook. And again, that's something, if you're interested in following, uh, then please send us an email and we will put you on our mailing list. Catherine. We also really invite any and all of you to join us in our lobby visits. I do the lobby coordination for MCAT. So if you're not working with a group, um, if you want to put your email in the chat, I'd be happy to contact you. Um, and if you put your email in the chat and you know what district you're in, <laughs> it's even better, or who your legislators are, um, because we do have teams uh, meeting now you know, kind of right at the beginning of the um, session, we'll be meeting again with legislators in about a month or two, and then we'll be helping with the Oregon League of Conservation Voters lobby day near the end of March. Um, so we're mm -hmm. happy to help plug you in to a team that's going to meet your legislator. Can I, can I, can I make a request that the, that the slides be, that Mike email out the slides? Yes, yes, we'll provide Mike with the slides and he will email them out uh, right after the meeting. Yeah. And, and we, we'll put the slides on our web page so uh, they'll be available. Okay. And if anybody wants me to individually send them out a copy of the slides, please let me know. I'd, I'd like a copy. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Mike, and I, I can copy Kathy when I send it to you, save you a little bit of time. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Can I ask a question as to why the group is not addressing root cause on all of this stuff? What do you mean by root cause? Did I understand that? Yeah, yeah you probably did, but it's, it's like the entire focus of everything seems to be that coal is evil, oil is evil, natural gas is evil. You know, all of these things are evil. And <laughs> the root cause of all of this is population. It's mm. because we keep on expanding our population, which causes all sorts of other problems throughout the entire state and throughout the entire world. You know, resources are getting thin and yet we still keep on subsidizing more people. 1960, we had 3 billion people on the planet. 
we're up to 8 billion people now. You wait another 62 years at this rate, we'll have 21 billion people. You wait another 62 years, we'll have 57 billion people. I yeah, mean, Doug, you know, yeah. you know, so, I can remember I was, I think I was seven years old when we first passed the 3 billion people mark. So mm -hmm. I remember in mm -hmm. my lifetime, we have more, almost tripled the number of people on this planet. So yes, but it's, it's not a dry, I mean, it's, it's a driver of many things, but it is, it is not a solution in and of itself. It, um, you know, we, we need, you know, and it's really, I don't think, you know, it's not that coal is evil or oil is evil or natural gas is evil. Those things have provided significant improvements to the, you know, the standard of living of everyone mm -hmm. around this planet, but it, they've also caused tremendous harms. And uh, we're, you know, not just the local air pollution and the, you know, the digging up of the environment and everything else, but, but the climate calamity that we are facing now is being driven by our fossil fuel use. And if we don't transition to clean energies and the more sustainable way of living, then this is civilization is going to collapse. And it's not just my opinion. This is something that lots and lots of people have studied over many, many years. And, you know, we have already seen that there are that this global civilization that we have is fragile in many different ways. And it's been tested now, you know, through pandemics and, and you know, the new specter of, of war in, in Europe. And, you know, so yeah, so we've got a lot of things. And so why resist the transition with this has so many other positive benefits associated with it. And, you know, building a more equitable world is also part of what we, we need to do if we really want to survive over the next, you know, 20 to 30 years. That's really all we have is, in fact, some people would say if we don't really solve this problem in terms of changing direction dramatically in the next 10 years, we may never solve it. Yeah, so, I don't, Pat, I, I'd like to, uh, Pat, I'd like to, uh, Alan's got his hand up very please. patiently. I'd like to take a question comment from him, and then I think we're out of time. Alan, you're muted. Alan, you're muted. Thank you. Um, I, I, as an ecologist, I just wanted to point out to Doug that the impact of any species on its environment is not just the number of them, it's also what they do. And in the case of our climate is the concern, the, the, the issues are resource consumption and waste production. And uh, when we when we try and go to the population blame, what we're doing is actually, and I'm, I'm gonna raise some hackles here, we're actually being racist. What we're doing is saying it's all their problem, but the real problem is our consumption. Certainly, if everybody on the planet had the same um, rate of consumption and waste production of us, we'd be in deep doo-doo. But what we can do is control, we can resolve our problems and help other nations and other peoples achieve economic growth without all of the problems that we have created. So let's, let's, let's stop our consumption before we start blaming everybody else for, for having babies. Uh, that really troubles me. Um, I just checked that the link in the chat doesn't work. Oh dear. Mike, thanks for having yeah. us. Just, just I'd, like to, I'd like to mention that everybody in, in the world aspires to have the same standard of living that we have and, uh, and to deny them that is, is, is really uh, foolhardy, I think. And, uh, and the population is an issue that uh, goes, um, nobody wants to address. It's a political hot potato, it's a religious hot potato. And uh, if uh, we don't do something about uh, um, the population in this, in this world, and there's no dialogue either at the state level, the national level, the international level on what an appropriate level of population is relative to the resources we've been given. And I think that that's something that uh, needs to be dealt with along with the use of uh, carbon fuel. Just to address you your me. consumption. Pardon? Just address your consumption first before you blame everybody else. 
Well, yeah, I, but I, I think that wants, wants the same level of consumption that we all have here. It's, it's a standard, it's a natural progression. I, I mentioned that when I was responding. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I don't want everybody. Everybody. This, this is a, a, a great discussion and uh, brought up some issues that I've thought about mm -hmm. a lot also. Thank you, Pat and uh, Catherine and and uh, Rich and Dan, and Dan for taking the time to put this program together. And thank you for having one, one of those slides of what we can do. And I was hoping to learn something about that. That slide will be on our webpage and uh, I'll be, certainly be taking a look at it myself for our group. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.